beam quality or beam characteristics and filtration. Okay, if you're reading, you should be having some questions. If you are, there should be some statements in there that you are just not understanding. This is how I know that you're reading, and it is highly important for you to read before I get to it, because it is the recipe for success for me is you read it, I speak on it, and then you reread it, and it gives you a better understanding of what my expectations are, okay? So if we're not having any questions from the material, then I am going to start thinking that we are not prepared for this class. And I don't want to think that. Right, Tracy? You're smiling at me. Thank you, Tracy. So with that being said, y'all need to start having some questions because I'm not covering the entire 100% of the chapter. I am not. I don't have time for, for all of it. The, the, the bulk of it, the big concepts of it, yes, I do. However, the small, I don't, okay? But I am definitely available for you to go over it, but you need to bring your questions, okay? You have to bring your questions. You can't just tell me, start over, because that is not going to help us, okay? So do I have any questions about the material? Ms. Laura, I, I have a question. Um, it was about um, the the two reasons that the um, of the tungsten target or most what is it? I think it says the tungsten target. Most of the photons and brims are for two reasons. So I was confused on on those two reasons. Read your sentence to me one more time. Oh, when the book, it says, um, in a tungsten target, most of the photons are brims for two reasons. So then it gives you the characteristic interactions, the first one, and then it gives you the second reason, which is the right. fifth electron. And in your PowerPoint, and I sent, I updated the PowerPoint that you have, and again, like I mentioned on Friday, I'm gonna continue to always update my PowerPoints as I try to deliver the information. Um, I love you too. What? Speaking. Oh, okay. All right. So with that being said, um, there are two reasons why brems are most likely going to happen because electrons are constantly spinning around the nucleus. So it's almost like trying to hit a moving target. Chances are you're going to not, right? So that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons. So it's more difficult to have a characteristic interaction created because of the fact that the electrons are constantly spinning and spinning around the nucleus. So it's a moving target in itself. The nucleus is pretty stable. And so um, it is more uh, and centered. So it's easier for an incident electron to find the nucleus more than it is in an electron that is spinning around. Okay. So that's the reasons why rims are more um more of the x-rays that are created in those types of interactions another question all right good question amy so let's go ahead and get started then since we have nothing else to review from last week so we're going to go ahead and start moving on into we talked about a bit, a bit of brim. So when we're thinking about characteristic, when we're thinking about characteristic interactions, we're kind of thinking about this concept. We're taking a marble, which is an incident electron, or a filament electron, however you want to call it. It's the electron that's going to possess kinetic energy. So if you take a look at this child, this child's about to flick it. It is a stationary object. It's stationary, like a space-charged electron. It is stationary. Something is going to propel it forward and give it energy in the form of motion or kinetic energy. So once he flicks it, and as you can see that he's aiming, he's aiming to hit another electron. If, in fact, this marble collides with another electron, it is going to simulate what characteristic ionization is. The only difference is 
when you have a characteristic um, interaction, when you have a characteristic interaction form where the filament electron comes in and ejects an inner shell, a case shell is more valuable because it has higher binding energy. And I think back from our discussion on Friday, John, it's not the binding energy that is coming in from the incident electron to removing the case shell. It never talked about it. I read through this book. I looked at the other resources that were available, which is the Bouchon's um, book, and which gives it much more detail than the other book that we were using prior to this one. It's not being generated from the actual removal of the case shell, the photon. It is the characteristic photon that is going to emerge is going to be what this path or what this K uh, electron left behind the binding energy minus whatever other electron is dropping down. So the characteristic photon that emerges is not from the actual filament electron ripping. It is actually the characteristic photon emerges from a cascading effect only. So when you go back and you think about it, you're saying, okay, I'm looking at this child. They're about to lick this marble. It is going to collide. Now, once this marble is in motion, what kind of energy does it possess? Kinetic. Kinetic. Kinetic energy. Once it collides with another marble, it is going to transfer its kinetic energy. It is going to transfer its kinetic energy. If it removes an electron, it is ionizing. We only see ionizing in characteristic interaction. Okay? So, the kinetic energy... The kinetic energy, if it has the ability to remove an electron, is the result of producing x-rays. Make sense? And ionizing. Well, we're going to talk about the kinetic energy again. What was the recipe of creating x-rays? Uh, who can remember? What were the three steps in producing x-rays? Electron source. You have to have an electron source. Good. And then... It's right here. <laughs> you have to have electrons that move, right? <laughs> yes. And then we have to have them do what, Jess? It abruptly stops. Isn't that what we're talking about all along with characteristic interactions? Okay. Any questions about characteristics? I am moving happily moving on to brands. Well, in this one, talking about the um, the uh, recipe for x-rays, we talked about, okay, here we have the liberated electrons. We got to get them to move, and then we got to have them collide. That's not actually true. It was easy to remember because we see that in characteristic, but not for Brim. Brimstrahlung, which is a German word for breaking the speed, breaking the speed, breaking the kinetic energy motion, or slowing down. So what happens in this type of interaction is it doesn't collide. It feels like a collision because of the abrupt stopping. It's almost like, again, if you're about to hit a car in front of you and you slam those brakes, right? You slam those brakes to avoid hitting the person in front of you. You have just released, you have stopped all of that kinetic energy, okay? If you were to hit something in the process of trying to stop, you would still transfer that motion energy onto whatever you collided with or interacted with. So here, basically in a nutshell, the filament electron or the incident electron, because the incident electron is what's creating the interaction. The incident electron, which is a filament electron, is creating the interaction. Okay? So the incident electron is the one that is creating the interaction. So if the filament electron misses all, all of them, all of the orbital electrons, and interacts with the nucleus, not colliding, 
The nucleus is never touched. The nucleus is never touched. There is no collision with the nucleus. I'll say that one more time. There is no collision with the nucleus of the target atom. But what does happen is the fact that the attraction, because we know that the electron is attracted to the nucleus, why? Why is the electron that's in motion attracted to the nucleus? Yes, Naomi? There's protons in there. There's protons in there. There is a positive charge. That electron is so attracted to that nucleus because it's attracted to the protons. So the attraction causes the filament electron to slow down because remember, this is a racing. This is a racing. This is a racing full of kinetic energy electron. It gets so slow, it breaks up and changes direction because of that attraction. It releases in that angle, in this change of direction, in the change of direction, the speed or kinetic energy that it once had is released in the form of a brim photon. Remember how I said photons are bundles of energy? Technically, most part, for characteristics, they're binding energy. For brim, it's kinetic energy. It's still energy, right? So energy is being converted over to another. Make sense? Questions? So binding energy is in characteristic interaction, right? We're releasing our binding energy in the form of a photon. In brim, we're releasing kinetic energy in the form of a photon, resulting in a brim photon. If it's binding energy, it's a characteristic photon. Pretty simple, right? Yeah? Anyone? Good? Thumbs up? Let me take a quick poll to see if we're understanding this. Thumbs up? Perfect. Love it. Don't write all of this down because you have it. If you have these numbers on your slide, you're paying more attention to double writing than you are to listening to what I'm saying because this is important. You have this information. You do. I promise you. Okay? You may not have all my pictures, but you have this information. Okay? All right. So the energy of Brim's photon can be found by subtracting the energy that the filament electron leaves the atom and so on and so forth. So you're just basically saying, okay, if I have a filament electron that enters an atom, the nucleus surrounding, right, at 100 keV, passes so close to the nucleus and leaves with 30, how much of a, is the Brim photon worth? What's the value of the Brim photon? 70, 100 minus 30. This is simple subtraction. Got it? Yes? Any questions? Will there be questions like this on the exam? Yes. Simple subtraction. Got it? Question. Yes. Uh -huh. Can we use paper for this? Because I can't do simple subtraction in my head like this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're good. All right. So do we all understand what Brem's about? Brem does not collide with the nucleus. It does not collide with the nucleus. It gets so close to the nucleus. It's so attractive as it's passing it, it's losing. It's like, er, it's coming back. Have you ever done that? You've seen something and you have to U-turn to come back towards it? With the brim, what's what the filament electron is doing around brim? But when they make that quick U-turn, they're dropping a lot of their motion energy or what we call kinetic energy. Make sense? But there is no collision and there is no ionization in brim. So here's back to you, Amy. With a tungsten target, most of the photons produced in our X-ray beam, because we're going to get to the X-ray beam, are brim. Because K, the electrons are so, we're talking about moving, moving right here. This is what's in red. The filament electron is more likely to miss the orbital electrons because it's constantly moving. You're hitting, trying to hit a moving target. It's difficult. But with the characteristic interaction, those only involving the K-shell, 
are important. Even though you may be generating five photons, only one is useful. Only one of it is useful. So just because you're generating more photons doesn't mean that they are considered worthy enough to be in the X-ray beam. Make sense? Easy to understand? Any questions here? So here's my star, and this is going to be a kind of a review. This is what we've been talking about. These are the interactions. You do not have this in your slides. So you may want to take a picture, which is going to be easier for you. So instead of writing everything down, okay? So in review, filament electrons must possess kinetic energy, right? Yes, they must possess kinetic energy. When they transfer this kinetic energy on the anode side at the focal spot, the actual focal spot, three things will happen. Most commonly, the kinetic energy is not going to be sufficient enough to ionize any orbital electrons, but excite them. Those orbital electrons will absorb their kinetic energy, the kinetic energy from the filament electrons, and get excited. That vibration of excitement is going to be released as a form of thermal energy, heat. Make sense? Questions there? All right, good. So when a filament electron is, uh, releases the kinetic energy or has this kinetic energy and ionizes a target electron, meaning they ejected an electron out of its orbit. In that process, they start the cascade. John, what does cascade mean? Um, it's the uh, so it, when when the elect when the electron in an inner shell is knocked out, then uh, by the by the incident electron, um, there's a all the other ones jump Stop in it. to f drop in to fill the to fill the uh, the void that was left and they all do it kind of in sequence very good so we say thank you john so when we say the cascade of orbital electrons depending on which inner shell electron was ejected we prefer k because it has a higher binding energy right so once that starts a phenomenon starts called the cascading characteristics interaction so all of these photons emerge because of that drop down of the outer shell to fill in the inner shell. Good. The filament electron possesses kinetic energy and could possibly do three, which is um, coming in so fast, getting very close to the nucleus of the target atom and breaking, changing directions at the same time. In that change of direction with the breaking, there is a photon that is released. So heat, characteristic photons, and REM photons. Those are the three different types of interactions. Now, two of these can happen all the time, but not all three. And we're going to talk what influence uh, this one, characteristic. So. Heat and brim can happen all the time, but not so much characteristic, okay? So, how do we get, how does the filament electron get kinetic energy? And we've spent some time talking about potential difference. What does that mean, anyone? What does potential difference mean, and how do we make it stronger or weaker? Difference in attraction between the atoms? Is it different. the increase and decrease of positive um, attraction? Yes, and so we do that. Where is this positive attraction located at? The in the anode? In the anode. And so yes. how do we manipulate that as operators, as technologists? We are going to manipulate the voltage because voltage is the unit of measure. 
for potential difference, meaning the attraction versus a positive versus negative attraction. So we will determine what the potential difference is by manipulating our KVP, kilo voltage peak. Okay, we determine once we select a kilo voltage peak, which we'll talk about in just a moment, it's basically saying, what is the energy level that I want my photons to be released out of this tube? What is the energy level of my photons that I want them to be released at? It's going to be totally dependent on your objective. Am I doing a chest? Am I doing an abdomen? Am I doing a finger? Am I doing a leg? Make sense? So we'll get into that. Any questions about this review slide? It basically puts everything that we have talked about in chapter six in a nutshell, I think, at least. Any questions? Nope. All right. So the x-ray beam, when we think about the x-ray beam, we've talked about incident electrons, filament electrons, target atoms, target atom electrons, target atom nucleus. We've talked to the characteristic photon, rim photon, heat, excitation, ionization. All those words are describing things, right? Now we are at here. We're under the anode. We're passing up the effective focal spot. And once we get out of the effective focal spot, we are here. We are at the X-ray beam. Okay? The X-ray beam is going to have some characteristics about it. Is it a useful beam? Is it a hazardous beam? Is it a weak beam? Is it a strong beam? Okay? And again, we determine what we want out of our x-ray beam by manipulating our factors on the console okay what is the console again the operating yes ruth go ahead what is the operator console it's where the exposure factors are controlled Perfect. That's where the exposure factors are at. That's where the exposure button is at. You may be able to uh, select a focal spot size, which is going to be selecting your filament size, so on and so forth, right? A lot of stuff we have covered in a short amount of time. A lot of stuff. But that operator console, which was learned way back in summer with Miss uh, Bourne talking about the parts of an x-ray room. Correct? Yes, and then we kind of duplicated it again at chapter one. So we should all be we should all get familiar with an operator console. How many of you have gone out to Aldi? Nobody's gone out to Aldi? Okay, so what does Ms. Sharonda say? Does she like you to operate that console? Has she yeah. talked to you about going to the console, go select your KVP, go select your mass? Not yes. yet? Yes. Not yet? Yeah. Well, she's waiting on me. A lot of them are waiting on me. A lot of the clinics are waiting on me to say my junior should know how to operate that console. They're waiting on me. So this is what we're learning. When to manipulate the KVP, when to manipulate the mass, right? When to manipulate MA over time, when to increase time over MA, so they're waiting on me, okay? At the end of this semester, we should be a little bit more familiar with the console, okay? So I'll let Candy know and Diego know and and, and um, Kim know and Sharonda know and, uh, oh, um, she's the sweetest, Lorena and um, Demetria. Let them know that y'all are ready for the console operations. Got it? So pay attention so that we can make sure that you start to be, you start to have the ability to apply what you're learning. Make sense? Questions before we get into the x-ray beam. No? We're all on board? Yay! Okay. So here we have 
properties of the x-ray beam. We know what we're talking about when we say the x-ray beam. We are leaving the x-ray tube. Finally, we're leaving the x-ray tube, right? Now we are going to exit. Well, we can't exit all the way because we know that this is going to have a combination of REM x-rays and it, depending on the energy that we use, we're going to have a combination of characteristic x-rays, right? But how do we know we don't have those MNOP characteristic photons in there, which are not useful, right? So we want to be able to eliminate. We want to be able to eliminate those non-useful beam or x-rays in the beam. So here we go. When we start talking about the x-ray beam in its totality, we're talking about the beam quantity and the beam quality. You're going to hear me say this and Ms. Bourne say this and, and Mr. Donnie, you say this from now on. Beam quantity and beam quality. When you have these in a desirable fashion, then you have a great primary beam. It is going to do the work for you. Okay, so how we select the beam quantity and the beam quality is important. But first, we're going to have to talk about how we make the beam safe. Filtration is that. Now, how many of you are coffee drinkers in the morning or all day? Whatever, whatever, coffee drinkers. Okay, great. Now, how many of you... Mm, I'm a Keurig person. This is simple. It's probably one of the best inventions everywhere. But before that, you, if you, for those that don't, you'll use a filter. There is a filter. You place the coffee grinds on it, right? And the water goes through it. And after the water goes through and soaks through the coffee grounds, through that filter paper, you have coffee flavored water, right? Or coffee. Make sense? So what is the coffee doing, Luke? I mean, what is that filter doing? What is it, technically, what is its function for the filter? To help, like, to keep out some materials and to keep in what we want. My heart, it sings. It sings. Thank you, Luke. So with that, the filter's function is to keep out some things and let others pass. So in the coffee analogy, it kept the coffee grounds out and allowed the flavor or the stimulant or the chemicals, <laughs> whatever, go through. It allowed certain things to pass, the water. So in this, it is the same concept. Filtration is the use of a material it's going to be either aluminum or aluminum equivalent, something that is going to give you the same type of result as aluminum. Now, aluminum is on the periodic table. It's an element, okay? It's on the periodic table. I'm not asking you to know the number. I, what I'm asking you is to know what aluminum is abbreviated. So the material for tube filtration is aluminum or aluminum equivalent. Okay, and this stands for aluminum. So what does it do? It absorbs x-rays that are not useful, that will not add quality or, or, or is over quantity but not useful to the primary beam. So we need to get them out of there, right? We know protective housing absorbs leakage radiation, radiation that's going in different directions. But... We know that the tube housing doesn't necessarily protect us where the window is. Make sense? The tube housing is going to protect any radiation that is leaked out from any other part, but not at the tube window. So we have three types of filters, okay? Three types of filters. However, two of them are regulated by law. Two of them are regulated by law. So, the ones that we see inherit, inherit filtration, inherit filtration, 
added filtration. And if we need more filtration, we will get something of a compensating filter. If we need more filtration, we will get a compensating filter. So let's take a look at these. Inherit filtration already comes assembled. Remember when I said about the glass x-ray tube or the metal envelope, the envelope, the glass envelope or the metal envelope, it's vacuumed, right? If it breaks, if something breaks on the inside, we have to replace the entire thing. It's already assembled, right? The rotor is where the rotor is supposed to be. The disc is where the disc is supposed to be. The cathode is where the cathode is supposed to be. It's assembled. Yes? Good? Perfect. Well, the target window, where is that? Amy, what is the target window? I know I've talked about that before. The port or the window. Target window. Where have I seen that before, Amy? It's... My mind just went blank right now. But it's where the x-ray or the x-ray beam is going to come out through. Beautiful. So right at where the effective focal spot is, right under the anode, it is where the target, where the x-rays will exit out of the envelope, right? And eventually out of the x-ray tube. So at the target window, it looks a little bit different than the rest of the glass. It has, or it is laced with... 0 0.05 millimeters of aluminum. So this window that is situated between the actual focal track or actual focal spot and the target window, right, that's where your effective focal spot is, is um, lined, I'm going to say laced, lined with 0 0.05 millimeters of aluminum. Because remember, we've already have that effective focal a spot, that's where our primary beam is going to exit out of the window. So the target window is not very big. And so that area of the glass is lined with 0 0.05 millimeters of aluminum. That's just the way that the, that the tube came. It's already assembled that way. Make sense? Ms. Laura? Yep. Just to, just to clarify, the book says 0 0.5, not 0 0.05. So I just wanted to make sure, make sure I use the right number. You know what? Yeah, that's my mistake. I see it now. You're right. So let me tri triple check. Thank you for catching that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got an extra zero. It, this is where it should be. Okay. So that's why I just, just want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for catching me. I appreciate it. 0. 0.5 millimeters of aluminum is the primary contributor. Okay. Because so together with the added, it should be 2.5. So thank you, Jonan. Thank you. So added filtration, leaving the target window behind. As the primary beam continues to descend, there is going to be another added, added filtration. Okay? This is going to be 2.0 millimeters of aluminum. Where is it going to be placed in? And I'm going to have a diagram for you that you're ready to take a picture so it'll give you a better idea than what your book is providing for you. The target window and the top of the collimator. So let's take a look at that. But before we get there, inherit plus added will give you total filtration. And by law, you have to have 2.5 millimeters of aluminum of total filtration to operate a X, an X-ray tube safely. Okay? So this is what you have right here. Total filtration, here we have the port window or the target window right here. It is already lined with 0.5 millimeters of aluminum. We add another thin layer of aluminum, which is about 1.0 millimeters of aluminum. And right here is our collimator assembly. So you can just imagine when you're doing the knobs, when you're turning the knobs for collimation, this is what it kind of looks like on the inside. There is a light bulb, and we all see the light, right? We all turn on the light. Some of us turn it on more than others, but we turn on the light, okay? So the light bulb is off to the side. Here, we're directing that light to a mirror. The mirror is also providing filtration. So here's the primary beam, 
its exit, it has now gone through one layer, 0.5 millimeters of aluminum at the target window, another layer of aluminum, one millimeter of aluminum, and then again through the collimator mirror for a total of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. That is considered total filtration. Inherent filtration plus added filtration. And most of the time, the mirror does get included, if you're considering the collimator assembly, does get included with the added filtration for a total of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So exciting. So why is tube filtration important? We're going to get to that. These of, I want to just, because we want to go and remove some of those weak rays, but compensating filters. Now these are voluntary. These are voluntary. Compensating filters are voluntary. You need it, whatever, they're exam dependent. Many of you probably haven't seen a compensating filter being used. A lot of them are, are already stored inside of the um, X-ray tube. I know that many of you may see, how many of you have seen a scoliosis series at Bone Clinic up on top? Scoliosis series where they stand up and they'll kind of, not yet? Okay. Sometimes they'll put like pads or something and that. It's just a radio opaque object to absorb. Compensating filters are a little, behave a little bit different. They still filter. They don't really block anything. They don't absorb um, anything to keep it um, like a radio opaque. What they do or what they have is just enough material to be placed over a variety of patient thickness. What's it going to do? It's going to give you a more uniform exposure to the IR, kind of like the anode heel effect. What was the anode heel effect again, Ms. Betty? It's um how much like I the way I remember it's like the thinner the patient, the thinner like like That's we use the, the thin anode. Thin. Yes. Right. You place the cathode over the thicker part of the patient, and you place the anode over the thinner part of the patient, right? So that's the anode heel effect. Here, we're also taking into consideration that we can't do the anode heel effect. So we know that if we're looking at this foot, what they have placed is called a wedge pipe filter onto the collimator assembly, okay? Now this is going to reduce, you see, the amount of x-rays, the quantity of x-rays on one primary exposure or the exposure. So here on the thinner part of the foot, we would place the thicker part of the wedge. On the thinner part of, uh, on the thicker part of the foot, we would place the thinner. We have more x-rays being filtered through the thinner than we do the thicker. So we can see that this is to even out the brightness or the viewing of this contrast and thickness. Does everyone see that? That is called the wedge filter and your book kind of comments on it, right? Now, another type of filters that's also listed in your book is the boomerang and the trove. And so all of these do the same kind of thing. They are adjusted or selected based on what you're trying to x-ray, but ultimately you're just trying to get a uniform exposure incorporating a, a, a big difference in thickness, right? This is thicker. Does everyone see that the skin and this, the foot, the top part of the foot is thicker than it is the toes? So we want to minimize the amount of x-ray exposure on the toes and maximize our x-ray exposure on the foot, the calcaneus. Make sense? So that way we have a better um, viewing of the uh, types of uh, x-rays. So here is another example. Here's the wedge. X-rays of the primary beam are coming in. They're like exiting of the collimator assembly right at the wedge, the thicker part, less x-rays. At the thinner part, more x-rays, right? 
the TRO is just another type of x-ray uh, compensating filter where you want to minimize on the outside and you want to have more penetration on the inside for more x-rays. Are there any questions about compensating filters? They are voluntary. They are not required by the FDA. <laughs> they are not required by law. However, inherit and added filtration to create a total filtration of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum is required by law. Any questions there? So why is filtration so important? Why is filtration so important? Because we want to remove what? To control the radiation that's coming out of the window, the port. The extra x-ray. To make it a stronger beam or to make it a weaker beam? What is it? What are we going to do with the filtration? We, what are we weeding the out? The weaker ones. We want the weak photons removed from our primary beam. Because if we don't, we are going to expose the patient right and what is the what is the exposure to the patient are these SIs or is this traditional are these SI units or are these traditional SI SI so the gray is going to be the unit of measure for what bring it back rad, rad, chapter one rad, rad, rad. now rad is traditional Gray is going to be the unit of measure for what? Patient dose. Patient dose. Sievert is going to be the unit of measure for what? Occupational. Occupational dose. Beautiful. Coulombs per kilogram is going to be the unit of measure for what? Radioactivity. Back in the room. So if we do not incorporate filtration, then this affects all of this, doesn't it? Not just the patient, but the occupational worker, and then the room itself. Anybody else in the room? Make sense? Don't forget these. We're done with filtration. Any questions on filtration? Okay, let's take a small break, five minutes. Go do what you got to do. Do what you have. To, you can go ahead and do whatever it is that you need to do five minutes. And then we're going to come back with beam quantity and beam quality. Beam quantity and quality. Okay. Laura, yes. Laura, can you put back the slide for filtration, please? The one that we don't have. Uh, the next one. Uh, one more. A little bit more. One more. That one. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Laura, is the the two point five? Is that just the the, the minimum the, the minimum standard? Yeah. For the filtration. Yeah. Okay. Because the compensating filters, when you add them, when you add the compensating filters, are going to have a varying result. Okay. How does that yeah. factor in with uh, like when we get a little bit? Further here, the the half value layer. Yeah, because I see that that's um, it, the filtration for that is three to five. Right, but the half value layer is a way of measuring the quality of your beam. Now, this is just talking about whether the, the type, whether it's um, two filtration and half value layer shouldn't get confused. Even uh -huh. though you're talking about a, a material that is absorbing, uh -huh. the but the whole purpose is different. When you're using one to weed out the weak photons, you know what I mean? Yeah, that is yeah. your tube filtration and your, your minimum requirement by law that you must have as a safety standard on your general tubes is 2.5. Your half value layer is going to be based on reducing the quality of your primary beam. So you're able to determine how, how hard your beam is. And so that's a different concept. Okay, so just don't don't correlate filtration. No, you don't. Okay, okay. okay. that was that was confusing. Okay, thanks. 
Tube filtration is tube filtration. Yeah. Path value layer is determining just how, how, how the quality of the beam, how penetrating your beam is. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm about to rock y'all's world. <laughs> rock, rock, rock. <laughs> How many of you find it interesting? You like it, Jonan? Well, thank you, Betty. It's interesting to see the science work, and you know, even though you're you've been exposing people for some time now, you know, six months, no, no, sorry, two months. I'm thinking summer. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 a it's it's awesome to know what is happening inside the tube, and you guys have been relatively short time have come across a long way. A lot of information. Can I ask a question about the compensating filters? Yeah. Uh, so, well, I was thinking about this when we when we were studying for Rad Pro because, like, it had some pictures of of the shoulder, right? Some image of the shoulder, and like you see, like where like the humerus is, um, it's it's lighter where it's denser, and then like if you got as you got toward the top of the shoulder where it's thinner, it was really really dark. So is that a spot where you would use a compensating filter? A to, boomerang to, filter. A bo yeah. Boomerang compensating filter because it has that 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 boomerang boomerang shape. But either way, whatever you look at the compensating filter at the thicker, so the boomerang is kind of like this, right? So that would make sense. You place the shoulder there and the boomerang over at least to the top of the collimator or un or above the patient. So that they're able to absorb all those excess x-rays that are easily going to pass through the tissue. Okay. So the thicker the compensating filter is where you would expect more absorption of uh -huh. the x-rays. So that when it goes through that thinner material, it gives you a more uniform density. So yes, the boomerang compensating filter would be useful on the shoulder. Okay, so like I said, if you have, if you have, a, if you have so many going through the thinner part, your image is going to be little, it's going to look a little black, right? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So now you're starting to associate it. So yeah. the thinner the material, the more you're going to have of the transmission. And we're going to talk about transmission here. More photons are going through and reaching the image receptor as opposed to the ones that don't, which give you brighter image. Mm -hmm. Remember, if yeah. it's a radio yeah. opaque, the x-rays were absorbed, it's brighter on the image. If it's not, if it's radiolucent, which skin is, it is going to go through or transmit easily. The okay. opposite of absorb is going to be transmit. And we're okay. going to get to that in the next chapter. Okay, and so, so with that compensating filter, because less are able to get to the IR, it's, it won't be as dark now. It'll, it'll, it'll yeah, the dark. Less x-rays will be absorbed in the thicker part of the compensating filter, yeah. allowing excess x-rays to go through the part and not over penetrate it. Okay. Make sense? Okay, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're moving on. Okay. So beam quantity. Now we're at beam quantity. Quantity means this definition, please, please, please. And and the one thing I do not particularly care for, and I understand, and I remember we talked about the definition of intensity. And in this book, it says it's the quantity of photons and the energy. It continues that. It continues that definition through and through. However. However, in a lot of your resources besides this one, intensity solely means, solely, solely means the number of x-rays in the beam. Okay? So I'm going to have to get pretty creative later on because I do see, I do understand why they incorporate energy and quantity in intensity. This book does a fabulous job about it. So I'm going to have to really, really <laughs> come back to myself and say intensity does not just mean quantity. I tried to separate them, but your book is kind of bringing me back like a nucleus and said, we're going to have to make this work. Okay. So I'm learning with this new resource, um, their definitions 
Uh, and, and it does make sense. It truly does make sense. But um, it, it also adds confusion. It has a confusion layer. layer. So we're going to try to stick to the total number of photons means beam quantity. So if you take a look at this picture, if we were to go back and count all these particles, let's just think about it. So we're looking up at our x-ray beam. We're looking up. And we are going to count all of the x-ray particles, all these photons coming at us. That would be the x-ray quantity. Make sense? That is the beam quantity. If we were to start counting, one, two, three, that's how many photons are in the beam. Pretty simple. Everyone understand? So the quantity is just how many x-ray photons are in there. We're going to have a factor on the console that is going to regulate this. This is why it's important. Okay, it's kind of like how many soldiers do I want in the mix? How many photons do I want to operate with? Okay, so depending on what our objective, we know that we have objectives. We know that we have large objectives. We have small objectives. We have objectives, whether it's the chest. Uh, the abdomen, or both. This is a combo. I don't know what's going on here. But this is this is where we determine how many photons we want in our primary beam. Make sense? Now, do you recall, this is a very large, large objective or large field that we are exposing. What determines how many electrons are boiled off to cover this? Who's got that? How many, how many electrons are boiled when we have a large objective? What do we rely on to do boil off many electrons? Huh? Mass? Mm, not yet. Not yet. We're getting there. Is it the We're filament, the large or small yeah, filament? Asayas, you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. Mass is going to be that. But right now, what did you say? Who else said what? I, I said that if it was the filament size, the filament size. So what's the difference, Aurora, between the small filament and the large filament? Uh, the large filament, it will cover a larger um, area versus the small one will be smaller. So if I have a large area to x-ray, which filament am I using? Large, large filament. filament. Beautiful, beautiful, awesome, thank you. But yes, Asias, mass is going to control that. Mass is going to control how many electrons are going to be boiled off. The size of the filament allows us to not reach space charge effect. Daniel, what is space charge effect? Oh, uh... Oh, I remember good. What is space charge effect? Uh, that's the cloud that keeps all the extra um, electrons. Right. So the space charge effect means what? Too many electrons are in that cloud, right? So uh, yes. have a huh? Did you say something, Daniel? I think he agrees with me. All right, so when you have too many electrons, when you have a large objective, you have to pick the larger filament because you don't want space charge effect to happen. Beautiful, right? Got it. Wonderful. So beam quantity means what again? Um, Jessly, what does beam quantity mean? The number of, the total number of x-rays that are like being produced. X-rays where? The total number. Uh, where? Where am I finding these total number of X-rays? At the target, like the. <laughs> Go ahead, Javier. That's where the total there? number of X-ray photons in the beam. In the beam, in the beam, and the X-ray beam. We're done with targets. We're done with that. We're done with those filament electrons. We're in the beam. In the beam now. Beautiful. Love it. So, oh. Now, you don't have this, and this is going to be an opportunity for you to take a pic or write down what it is, because we're going to explain this. These 
are, are factors that we have an opportunity to manipulate at the console. The pro properties of the x-ray beam, which is quantity that we just talked about, is going to be influenced about our selection. I've already talked about that, right? I've already said that the operator is in control of generating how many photons we want to put into that beam. And Esaias is right. Esaias says mass. And we're going to learn why mass does that. But first, we got to know what mass is. Mass stands for milliampere times second. So the S is for second. The MA is for milliampere, or amperage. When you take both of those and multiply them, you have milliampere second. That is mass. Okay? We can take milliampere independently, and we can take time independently. And when we get into the next chapter, we will talk about how the math, the math, the math, is going to be regulated by time and milliampere. What is milliampere second? We're talking about current. Huh, where have I seen this word before? Too I good. just talked about current in chapter five. What is this current talking, referring to? The kinetic energy. Well, yeah, it's kinetic energy, but it's specific because kinetic energy can belong to a lot of things, and we know that this the filament electrons. But tell me, what is Villa Amperage is going to measure current? Yes, it's okay. the kinetic energy of the flowing electrons, but the current we're talking about is just that. Flowing electrons make tube current. The flowing electrons make tube current. What does current mean? What does current mean? <laughs> current means flowing electrons. Let's write that down. You with me, Luke? Thank you. Current is a flowing of electrons. So milliampere and second is going to measure my tube current. Here we have voltage. We know what voltage does. We've talked about voltage. So we have a kilo or thousand thousands volt, which is our unit measure of what? Potential difference. Peak is where the superior most top uh, selection we're going to get. If I select 100 kVp, my energy of the photons will not exceed that peak. If I select 75 kVp, the energy of my photons will not exceed 75 kEV. It won't. If I select 30 kVp, what's the highest my energy is going to be in kEV? Thirty. Thirty. Oh, we already have the math. Woohoo! Good job, guys. Good job. So KVP or the peak is what we set. We will determine why we need to set one hundred versus thirty. But and by the way, guys, I'm not sure if your book has already set it. Our diagnostic range, our diagnostic range, what we use in X-rays will never go beyond, it's 130, I mean, I'm 30 to 150 kVp. According to the previous resource, <laughs> but they kind of vary a little bit from resource to resource. It will never go above what, I'm sorry? 30 to 150 kVp. 30 to 150 kVp. 30 to 150 kVp. So, mass or milliampere second is going to measure our current. What current? Tube current. KVP setting, we're going to set the top, the top voltage of attraction for 
our cube. Okay? And we can do that at the operator console. So, beam quantity is affected by what we select on the operator console. Quantity, quantity does have an effect by other items. However, the number one contributor to affecting how many X-ray photons we put into the beam is mass. And we can select it. Here we have MA, here we have uh, uh, time, or we can put mass together. So the number one, the number one or the primary factor the primary factor, the primary technical factor, I'll put it that way, the technical factor that an operator can do, can use, is mass to affect our beam quantity. And you see my star. Stars are important. Okay, good. So, I'll give you an opportunity to write this down, even though I do believe you have it, but let's just, and I think I'm, what I'm doing is duplicating slides and then just kind of hacking them because I'd like to put pictures on them to kind of give a better relation. I hope that you guys are enjoying the pictures and it's kind of bringing things together. So the radiographer should associate quantity. This is a safety principle. This is a safety principle. How do I <coughs> reduce patient dose? How do I reduce patient dose? By reducing my mass. This is where we're going to eventually get into concept. But beam quantity should associate with dose. So the higher the dose, the higher the dose is contributing from the higher the quantity, right? So there are other factors that could, um, that could contribute to dose. Mass is not the only one. Mass is not the only one. So when adjustments in quantity are desired, you must control your mass. You must vary your mass. Yes. Uh, Sharon's trying to get back into the class. Yeah, I'm on already. I'm here. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fine. Thank you, guys. I see her. She's there. <laughs> okay. Any questions? None? Okay, moving, let's move forward then. Let's get on to looking at this image. Looking at this image. Now, the top row of images is basically film. The lower row, Mr. Alicia, are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so the lower oh. row is digital. That's Can so you see what the differences are? Can you tell the variance of what the differences are and who wants to speak on it? I know some of y'all are zoning out. If you need to stand up, please do so because this stuff is not going to go away. It's gonna be ever so present on your test on Friday. <laughs> okay. What's the difference? Okay, so Valen told Wani, what's the difference? So we're gonna take the bottom row because the bottom row is more digital. So looking at the image to the far left and looking at the image to the far right. What's I the just, difference there? I just see like some images are dark and other like, I will Very see good. the way they select in the mass, I don't know, the, is. the console or something like that. The you intensity, no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you did, perfect, you did it great. Remember this word that we said exposed, right? 
and we start talking about radiation dose and we're talking about the exposed, we're going to start taking into consideration how many photons were entered into the primary beam. Did we have more than we needed? Did we have way too many in here? Did we have not enough to get the job done? Make sense? So how many photons we put into the x-ray beam to get our objective is important. What regulates that so far? What technical factor regulates how many photons we have? Uh, mass, and we have to... Thank you, Isaiah. Now we yeah. see, thank you, mass. Mass regulates our beam quantity. So let's talk uh, about... Oh. Okay. What about uh, like uh, body habitus, like the patients? We will. And that's okay. you were right ahead to chapter seven. Good job, Asias. That's going to be in chapter seven when we start talking about body habitus, okay, and tissue and thickness and density and so on and so forth. So we have a lot yet to cover. So good job. Other things that affect our beam quantity, not, I'm going to knock on this one. Not as much as our mass. Our primary technical factor is mass. The other technical factor is KVP. Not as much as mass. And I'm going to explain why. When you want to affect the beam quantity, your KVP has to be doubled. So the original KVP has to be double. If I chose 60, I now have to go 120. Make sense? To increase a factor, the quantity of photons, by 4. So doubling my KVP from example 60 to 120 will increase my beam quantity. Okay? The 15% increase of KVP means 60 KVP times 0.15, or 15%. Increase is equivalent to doubling the mass. Now, let me explain why this is not a desirable. Changing your KVP is going to change the brightness of your image. Once you have selected your KVP, you have selected what you need. Doubling it is going to interfere with the image quality. Increasing it by fifteen uh, percent, increasing it by fifteen percent is going to interfere with the image quality. Make sense? Yes, KVP is doubled, or yes, KVP is increased, can make more photons enter the primary beam, but it is not desirable. Mm -hmm. Everyone understand what I'm saying? Yes, but it can happen. It can happen. If I double my KVP, you won't ever hear anyone say, go double your KVP. Okay? Any questions there before I move on? No? Okay. Good. Beam quantity can strongly be affected, and this is just what I'm talking about, by KVP, because what does KVP do? What does KVP regulate? It says it all right here. KVP, changing KVP changes the kinetic energy of the filament electron and makes them flow faster. It makes more interactions likely happen, right? The higher the KVP, the more likely you're going to have characteristic interactions. However, changing the KVP when we get to image quality is not desirable. So to really manipulate 
in quantity, we must manipulate which factor, which technical factor? Mass. Mass, thank you. So, did you know distance can also affect your beam quantity? Now, let me go ahead <laughs> and use this scenario. Um, I'm going to kind of open it up just a little bit. Okay, so I can see everyone. Anybody ever run a marathon? No? Nobody? No? Okay. How many of you were in high school and y'all were told to run? And then some were running faster, and then some were running slower, and then just some just stopped running and just blocked it because they were going to hyperventilate and pass out. Right? Yeah, Jessica, you're laughing, so you were the one, right? They carried you across the finish line. Got it. So when you think about it, and we're boiling off all of those electrons, they have a lot of potential. Right? They have a lot of potential. They're going to start off like those marathon runners. Okay, they're going to start off like those, what the gym coach told you, you're going to run a quarter of a mile, right? <laughs> and if you had to run at a constant speed, guess what? The farther the distance, the chance that you didn't finish. Make sense? Yes. The farther the distance, the chances are that you didn't finish. You you exhausted all of your energy coming out of the gate. And so you're like, ah, ah, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. Right? I've expended all my energy. Make sense? Same concept. Distance. The farther the distance, the less the photons reach it, depending on the energy they have. Make sense? So kind of like you, put yourself as that, as that photon. I was given this amount of energy, but my distance keeps going further and further and further away. Up. I give up. I'm done. Right? Um, it's a wrap for me. So here we have, and that's called a law. I'm glad you enjoyed the story. So beam quantity can be affected by distance. This is called the inverse square law, and we're going to take a look at it, okay? And I'm going to send you some math problems, so we can open up on Wednesday with some math problems. This is where the intensity of the beam, here's that word intensity, but we're talking about the quantity and energy of the beam is inversely, it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. What does that mean? Well, there is my distance, number one, and I increase the distance to back here. So my source is release, released. Here's my photons. If they travel to this distance, I have one entire dose. Let's just say dose equals one, right? But I move or increase the distance by twice the distance, and I only have one-fourth of the dose. If I three times the distance and so on and so forth. So what this is basically saying, whatever my first distance was, and I moved it to my second distance, right? Whatever my intensity was, energy and quantity, I have to now figure out number two. What is my new intensity? So for now, we're going to get into a problem or two. Not right now. But what I need you to know is beam quantity is affected by the distance. If I increase my distance, meaning I take, I take a ruler, this is at 12 inches, I need three more rulers, to this distance, my photons don't quite make it for that desired distance. So what does that tell you? When I have a 72 SID versus a 40 SID, 
Which one of those should I have already incorporate a higher intensity, Ms. Jalisha? So if I went from a 40 SID to a 72 SID, which one of them should have a higher intensity? The 40 SID? They should, right? So I went from 40 to 72. That one's going to have a higher one. This one is going to have a low. So if I know I'm choosing 72, I'm going to have to incorporate a higher intensity, isn't that? Yes, Just ma'am. Thank you. So we're going to have some problems. We're going to look at them first thing on Wednesday, and we'll spend some time. But if you don't understand the problems, it's uh, uh, cross-multiply and um, divide. We'll, we'll take a look at it on Wednesday, okay? Because I know math kind of struggles with people. I know. It, it just happens. Every spoken fact for training. Go ahead. Question? Can we use a calculator? Okay. Yep. Absolutely. You don't want to do it on paper now? Okay. Yeah, calculator works. Thank you. Uh-huh. So, now, filtration. We've already talked about filtration. We know that filtration is going to reduce our photon count. How, again? How does filtration reduce our photon account, uh, count? Yeah, it's rid of the weak x-rays, the weak photon. There you go. They read, weed out the weak, as one teacher used to say. Weed out the weak. All right. Perfect. So, I love charts. Gosh, I love charts. I love charts. So, going back, this is a review. Factors affecting beam quantity. We haven't even talked about beam quality yet, beam quantity. If we increase, because this is telling you what's happening, if we increase in either of these variables, it's saying what effect is going to happen on beam quantity. Please pay attention to this, because if you look at your registry outline, it incorporates this stuff in chart form. So again, if we increase any of these variables, what effect happens on beam quantity? So, increasing mass, what is going to have on beam quantity? How many photons will we add to the beam? It increases, right? Yep, good. KVP. If we double our KVP or increase it by 15%, we also know that we have an increase in beam quantity. If we increase our distance, what happens to our beam quantity? Goes down. And then what happens when we increase our tube Filtration. It goes down. Okay. So talk to me. Talk to me here. Can y'all still hear me? Because I know about after an hour this thing goes out. So talk to me. You guys have to talk. You guys have to say, Milara, you lost me a hello today. I just could not wake up. I hope that's not the case. You can chat privately. I won't tell your secret. But y'all have to understand everything that we just covered over being quantity is on this chart and why we covered it why it results in this i will give you charts i will ask you to fill in the blank i'm known for just having increase decrease or no change can you go back to the filtration one Okay, what about filtration? What is filtration? Um, okay, so it decreases the quantity. Whether it's inherent, added, mm -hmm. or total filtration, what does filtration mean? By definition, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, does it, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, does it filter out the photons we don't need? Correct. It filters out the photons we don't want in our beam. So if we add more filtration, what happens to the number of photons? Do they increase or decrease? 
they will decrease. <laughs> Make sense? Yes. Good. Perfect. Keep going. These are the questions. Can you mute me, Miss Lara? For some reason, I can't do it from my laptop. No problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I don't know why you're not muting. Hold on. <laughs> Can you please say something about me? I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I don't even see you. Okay. I think I probably tapped so many no, times. It's not showing me. It's not showing me. You're right. Hold on. There we go. Okay, you're good. Now, it's, can you still talk to me? Because I'm able to, and you're still. Okay, all right, all right. I think I can still hear you. Any other questions? Ms. Laura, um, can you go back to the uh, bean qu quantity? Um. I got lost when you started talking about if the KVP is doubled and the intensity and then how you okay, So KVP, so KVP is a technical variable. Remember when I said, when I showed you this slide right here, these are the ones that we have an opportunity to select. There's much more on the console. So let's take a look at the console. See that KV? And over here we have mass. So we're able to select them, right? But we know that if we want to control beam quantity, mass is going to be the one technical factor that is going to control best. Okay. However, when we look at KVP, KVP can affect the number of photons we put into the beam. But we have to do something extreme because it's not just about selecting KV. We have to double the KV. 60 to 120, 70 to 140, 30 to 60, whatever it is, to increase the number of photons. So that can contribute or increase beam quantity, but it has to be in extreme measures. 15% of increase of KVP can put more photons in the beam. It's equivalent as to doubling the mass. But I said that this is undesirable because once we select our KVP, once we select our KVP, we don't need to increase or decrease our KVP. Got it? But this is basically saying there is another way of putting more photons in your beam by either doubling your KVP or increasing it by 15%. And when we get to this rule, we absolutely have to know we'll have to do something to this because too many photons in your mean will give you overexposed. And we don't want to be overexposed. Make sense? Yes? No? Okay. Yeah, thank you. I hope that answered your question. Good. Anything else? Okay, keep the questions coming. I'm moving on to beam quality. Beam quality is the penetrating power. People say, well, what is the difference between beam quantity? That's the number of photons. You can have a whole bunch of soldiers on the front line, right? You can have you can have soldiers on the front line, front line, non with non-steroids. <laughs> and you can have a whole bunch of soldiers with a whole bunch of steroids, right? What would be the difference between that? What would be what would be the difference if you had a one group of people that was super strong and one group of people that were super weak? The strength. The strength, right? So you think your 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 soldiers with with super strength are going to be able to achieve more, right? And what if their objective was to penetrate through a wall? Do you think your group of soldiers that were stronger would be able to do it more easily to penetrate through the wall? Yes, you're right. You're right, Jonathan. So the more penetrating power or 
energy, penetrating power or energy, energy of the x-ray beam means beam quality. Beam quality means the penetrating power or energy of the x-ray beam. The higher the energy of the photons, the better the quality of the beam. So, penetration. This refers to those x-ray photons that are transmitted, transmitted through the body and reach the image receptor. Penetrating power are the photons that are transmitted through the body and reach the ever so wonderful image receptor. We know that some photons don't make it to the image receptor. They get absorbed, right? Bone, they, they interacted with bone and bone absorbed it. Some photons reach the image receptor and they may create that dark shade. Remember we talked about radiopaque and radiolucent appearance. Radiopaque is going to give you a what kind of image? What kind of image is radiopaque going to give you? White. White. Oh, yes, it's going to give you white. No problem. Okay, good. Yeah, you're right. It is bright. Perfect. And then radiolucent is going to give you what kind of color? Transparent. Not transparent. Transparent is not a color. Thank you, Wani. Black. Going to give you a dark color. Okay? Radiolucent means transparent or translucent, right? Good. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. So penetrating power or the energy, I say that again, this is my third time, fourth time, energy of the x-ray beam is going to give us the transmitting power, getting through the body, muscling our way through the body. Make sense? Do you think about that photon on steroids? Yes? So let's take a look at this image. I'm almost done. Now what's happening here? These are all x-rays. These are all x-rays. We know the x-rays, right? All of these are x-rays. What happens is that these pretty much contain the same type of penetrating power. If the pen penetrating power is not adjusted to what we needed, the x-rays will be absorbed and bone. We know that. The x-rays will not fully be absorbed in fat, okay, because we're going to discuss why in Chapter 7. But in air, these x-rays that came in were fully transmitted to the image receptor that is lying right here. So because this x-ray does not get to get deposited onto an image receptor, this section is going to be white. This section is going to be white. This section is going to be white, and so on and so forth. Make sense? This section is going to be dark. So the more we want our x-rays to penetrate through the body, we have to do something to give them more energy to do so. Make sense? And that is going to be, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, KVP. KVP is going to regulate the quality of the beam. KVP is going to regulate the quality of the beam. KVP is going to regulate how much it can penetrate, the photons can penetrate through the body. So I'm going to stop here.
the two main things that I went over today, I know I went over a lot, the technical factors that affect beam quantity, John N. The technical factor that affects beam quantity. Yes. Good. Sharon, the, the technical factor that affects beam quality. KVP. Woo! Guys, that is awesome. So please go over this material. It does not get, it, it, it gets easier the more you read it. Okay, but you have to allow yourself some time to read it so that you, it can start to flow. Okay? Memorizing it. No bueno. None. It's about concepts. It's about understanding, okay? And then from there, we'll get into um, emission spectrum. Okay? It's a little easier to understand. It looks more complicated, but it's actually a little bit easier. Okay? I'm going to send you some math problems, and I know I have the PowerPoints for um, Chapter 4. I'm just kind of cleaning them up a little bit, redefining what we want, what is essential to go over. And so I'll have both of some math problems for you today and some and a PowerPoint for you. Fair enough? Everyone can still hear me? Yay! Miss Laura, we can't hear you. <laughs> 